Okay, so we're back again this week mm-hmm. and we're uh, going to tackle a few more of these questions that we have from our, our viewers. So what's on the cards this week? Well, let me look at the teleprompter. Uh, we get, we're get we asked, has there been any work on how much more the universe could be fine-tuned to make life better or more efficient? So that's a, that's a pretty interesting question, actually. So we... The background here is that when we look at the constants of nature, when we look at uh, the initial conditions of the universe, things like uh, how fast was it expanding in its earlier stages and how much does an electron weigh and all those sorts of interesting things, it turns out there's a whole heap of ways to make the universe much less efficient at making life. Mm -hmm. So we can sort of unbind all the stuff that holds the periodic table together. We can make the universe expand too fast for structure to form. We can make it recollapse in half a second. We can do all sorts of horrific things. Um, Are there any ways that could actually make life more efficient? Are there actually ways to make it better? And I think there's a couple. There's a couple of interesting cases, and then there's a couple which, which might be a bit more obvious. So here's an interesting case that I enjoy talking about a lot. Uh, if you change the constants of nature in a certain way, you can make it so that the energy that's released in a chemical reaction and the energy released in a nuclear reaction are roughly the same. So if you want to send a proton into the nucleus of another atom and maybe split it apart, that'll cost you roughly about as much energy as if you want to mess with the electrons going around the outside. And so... um, In our universe, you can't light a fire, which is a chemical reaction, and expect one of those electrons to hit into a nucleus and cause a nuclear reaction, right? There's just the the energies involved uh, are just way too different, a factor of 100,000 or something. Um, But we could could make a universe where that sort of thing is possible. And now, you know, there's an open question of too complicated for life, or does it open up new possibilities? Okay, so... so I'm going to wind things back slightly right. here, right? Um, I think it's important to to remember that mm-hmm. one of the reasons that we can have uh, life in the universe is mm-hmm. because we have our periodic table of elements yep. and we have our roughly 90-something uh, natural elements plus a few that we can create in reactors, etc. Yep. And uh, it's... Oh, it's the International Year of the Periodic Table, by the way. Oh, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, and we wrote about this, and, and this still makes me scratch my head a little bit, uh, is that... You can you can make a nice chart of all of the uh, of the elements, mm-hmm. and we know you know hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. But of course, uh, each particular element can come with a slight variation. The isotopes, mm-hmm. which tells you how many neutrons there are in the nucleus. Yeah. Right. So you have carbon, and you can have carbon fourteen, mm-hmm. and so there's so many. There's six protons in carbon is that yes. right yes six protons <laughs> sorry <laughs> we're physicists not chemists <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to look this stuff up all the time and and so you know you can then calculate that there are eight neutrons etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. but there are different carbon uh, isotopes right and what you find is that when you draw a chart of your of all your elements there's a like a valley of stability so mm-hmm. there will be effectively for each element there will be some isotopes which are very stable and then as you move away they become less and less stable yep. and so the more more or less neutrons you put in the less stable the atom is right so you, you don't ever see carbon with 156 neutrons in it because that would be highly unstable and fall yep. apart you never see carbon with no neutrons in it because that would be highly unstable and fall apart right but we have this valley of stability and that valley of stability is a balance between the nuclear forces, yeah. right? So you've got your strong force, electromagnetic force, and even the weak force playing its part. Um, and so we, we're in a universe whereby what we have is uh, essentially a small number of stable isotopes and a whole bunch of unstable isotopes. Yeah. And when you look at the molecules from which we're built, right, we essentially are a mix of those, but mainly the stable ones because they're the ones that have been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. So we have this sort of stable set of building blocks that we can use, right? And um, we're, we're molecular machines, and so we run on chemical energy, which yeah. has that energy scale. Now, you're saying, though, if we mess around with the scales in the universe and you can bring the chemical scale into the nuclear scale, yeah, then the reactions in my body might not just you know move the electrons around but a carbon 
might turn into a nitrogen because that's a nuclear reaction. Yeah. Or you get those other kind of reactions going on where you would change elements. Yeah. Right. But our life as we know it relies on the fact that elements are generally quite stable. Right. But they can't be totally stable. So we do rely on the fact that, you know, um, one of the reasons why carbon is so useful is it's because it's metastable. It's sort of in a nice area where it's not going to change its you know, chemical bonds super easily, which is great because it means you know, your DNA is roughly the same tomorrow as today. Um, but it can be induced to undergo uh, some sort of change. So that the, the process by which DNA is read is the entire strand sort of gets pulled apart and then they read one side and then you wrap it together again. So you can pull apart those kind of... You know, you can make carbon elements, carbon-based elements do things in a way that you can't really make silicon-based elements do things. You just sort of make rocks and they sit there. That's that's right. So you, at some level, you want your carbon to stay as carbon because it's a very versatile atom. Yeah. You don't want the carbon in your DNA changing into silicon, which would be a nuclear reaction. But if, you know, this is for life as we know it, and that's an important sort of caveat. So the question here is, okay... What if I introduced in, into a system of, nucle- of, of chemical reactions? What if every now and then, um, or maybe even more commonly, uh, there could be enough energy in there to change one element into another element? Mm-hmm. Could, could that sort of process be incorporated into uh, a, a life form of some sort in this weird other universe that's not ours? Um, is that the sort of thing that could could make a, a, a much more versatile kind of life form that could do a whole heap of other things? And so that's an interesting kind of open question, which is why in fine-tuning, when, when a change to these constants makes a universe which is more complicated than our one, like in this case, um, unless there's really good reasons to think it's too complicated, like, you know, you've just made a completely chaotic universe, we, we don't write those ones off. So that could actually be an example. Yeah, yeah. So So... Yes, we could have more complexity in the universe. And that, as you said, that you could have life pow- powered by effectively nuclear reactions or a combination of nuclear and chemical reactions depending upon the levels, etc. Yep. So one question that I often get asked is then, where do we sit then? If, if, if you could have more complicated universes that could support life, why do we find ourselves in a universe where there's, there's, there is complexity, mm-hmm. but it's <clears throat> not super complexity right yeah so one of the points that's often pointed out is uh to put it that way uh one of the 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 points that's often made is that there's an awful lot of empty space in our universe for for example so surely there's a way we could make life uh our universe more you know inhabitable if we just sort of filled in some of the gaps and made some of the universe more uh life permitting so uh, an example of this is if you uh, so there's this number called the cosmological constant. It's one of the sort of famous fine-tuning cases. It makes the expansion of our universe accelerate. So what that means is starting from, you know, in the 13.7 billion years of our universe, starting from about now, you know, give or take a week or two, the uh, the way that structure is forming and coming together is starting to slow down because the expansion is pulling everything too far away from everything else. If you actually took that cosmological constant, which is sort of absurdly small in our universe anyway, but set it just bang on to zero, you wouldn't get that slowing down of structure formation. Um, It's made, actually, we've run simulations with a a colleague of ours, Jaime Salcedo at uh, Durham University. Now at Liverpool. Um, Now at Liverpool Moors. John Moors. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. We took one of these simulations, just run it off into the future to see what happens. And there's actually... Not that much of a difference between that universe and our universe, but it will make more structure just because there isn't this shutdown. The reason it doesn't make too much of a difference is most of the structure that will ever be made in the universe has already been made. Yeah. Um, and so it doesn't... But, it, you know, it, that is a way of putting more of the stuff of the universe into collapsed objects like halos in which you can form galaxies in which you can form stars and planets so there will presumably in those universes be more stars and planets so that's one way in which there's a little bit of room there actually i mean there's a there's an enormous cosmological constant problem we don't know why that number isn't 10 to the power of 120 times larger than we actually observe as we've discussed before 
But on that scale where we're at one, um, you could actually turn things down to zero and probably make a little bit more structure. Now, there was an interesting paper, uh, quite recently, I think 2017, quite recently, which said, ah, actually, let's just let's just take it easy with that one. There are these things called gamma ray bursts. Yes. So uh, as well as as structure coming together and making stars and planets, occasionally structure will come together and make an enormous explosion. So a gamma ray burst is, it's really a sort of uh, the way astronomers name something. We'll, we'll name it after what we saw on our end. What we saw was a whole heap of very high energy photons suddenly coming from one point in the universe, which indicates some sort of explosion. Probably the, the, the end of life of a very large star, something like that. So there was an argument in, in, in a paper uh, which basically said, all right, um, these happen in very, in very pristine gas. You need uh, gas which hasn't been churned around too much in stars, which has made heavier elements. Okay? And if I'm here in the Milky Way, that's all right because you know, I've, we've, we've churned all our gas up. So we're probably sort of reasonably safe from gamma ray bursts. But the worry is with these satellite galaxies, other galaxies that are flying around. Okay, so there's sort of layers of structure on structure in the universe. Any big galaxy like ours is, is surrounded by smaller galaxies. And in those ones, because they've, they're probably newer, they've probably had less time to and less star formation to churn up their gas, those are the ones that are going to produce the big stars that might knock us out. And, I mean, the, the, the rough back-of-the-envelope calculations is that a... A, a uh, gamma ray burst could take out, uh, a, you know, knock the atmosphere off a planet from an enormous distance. There's the distance that we are from the center of our galaxy, which is you know, about eight, eight and a half kiloparsecs in, in astronomy units. You could basically double that, put, a, you know, put one of these things on the other side of our galaxy and it'd, it'd, take out, um, it'd, it'd take out life on Earth or at least severely sort of knock it back a few notches. And so the thought is, okay, actually, let's not turn that cosmological constant dial down to zero because then you'll have more structure and you'll have more of these satellite galaxies ready to take stuff out. Yeah, We're in the process of actually putting together a lot of this physics for our simulations to see what happens. So there's there's a possible case. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, if we, again, go back to the fine-tuning question and, and this issue of... Um, Universes which have more complexity, mm -hmm. right? Probably there are more universes like this one than there are universes with more complexity. Uh, there's, there are there are universe. There's probably if you look at the volume of different kinds of universes, yeah. we have all the dead universes. Yeah. Then you have the universes like us where there's a bit of complexity where there's a, enough life, and then there's probably a smaller, just guessing, a smaller number of universes where there's even more complexity, which might be more friendly towards life, etc. Mm. Right? So maybe it's not surprising that we find ourselves in this universe that only has a limited amount of complexity, mm. right? Because there's probably more universes like that. Yeah. This, this is more conjecture and guesswork than anything else. Yeah. But you know, you can sort of understand that, yeah, we've got enough complexity for us to be here, but there might be other universes where there, there might be teeming with life because yeah. the uh, large amount of complexity allows it. There's Whenever people sort of guess at how they want to set a universe up, they often end up sort of ruining the universe as well, which is kind of funny. Um, so people say, well, you know, we can't breathe out there in space. And so you think, all right, let's just fill all of space with breathable air, shall yeah. we? Isn't that a great idea? Um, the problem with that is uh, within any system, uh, you know, gravity has a hold of it. Gravity will try to make it collapse. The amount of time it would take gravity to collapse it if it was if gravity got a hold of it, depends on only the density. All right? So you can take a density, you stick it in an equation, out comes a time scale for how long it collapses. If you put the, the average density of our universe in, you basically get the amount of time we've been expanding. If you put in the density of air, you get about a day, I yeah. think. It's one day. Yeah. So um, that's a really bad idea if you fill the universe with air yeah. today. You know, we all collapse into nothing tomorrow. Or... Um, we have to expand so fast that you end up sort of emptying out the universe anyway. Um, I think I did a nice little calculation, actually. Even if you could somehow just fill the solar system with air, the Earth uh, it now has a whole heap of drag yep. <laughs> on it. It spirals into the sun in about a month or two. Um, 
So actually, it's not easy to try and... How do you make a universe which is just totally filled with life from, from start to finish? And we don't really know how life forms anyway. But even like nice planets around nice stars, you know, we, we haven't got any particularly obvious, oh, things would be heaps better if you just made this little turn. There's there's I, I can't think of any of those. Yeah, unintended consequences, I think. Unintended consequences. Yeah. Um, okay, I think on that point, we've reached uh, the usual conclusion that we, we don't really know. <laughs> so let's come back to another question next week. Another win. Okay.